See, see, see what we, I got here? Man, I love these people. Man, most genuine people on the face of the earth. They just tell you what they think every time, all the time. All right. We'll go to 1 Samuel, chapter number 2, where I want to start. You know about this young Samuel. Hannah has brought her child and dedicated him to the temple. She was barren prior to. She asked the Lord for a child. And then she turns right around and dedicates that child to the temple. In chapter number 2, there's some peculiar reading. We're going to start at verse number 12. Eli is the, the priest there, and his two sons are serving with him. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are not good boys. They're not, uh, they're not living right. They're not godly. We're going to read a little bit about them, and then I want to come back. We're going to preach out of chapter 2, but I need to navigate through chapter 3 and 4, and then we'll come back to chapter number 2, and I want to show you some things. I want to preach on this subject, and I want to throw this subject out so you can see it as we read it. Religious but without the power of God. You know, a lot of people go through life, they go through the actions of religion, but there's no true power in their life. Listen, you want your marriage to last. Listen, you want your friendships to last. You want to have joy in your home, in your life, and around your brethren. Listen, you have to have the power of God working in your life, in your family. Your, your marriage will not last without the power of God in it. It will not last. This world, is, it trends uh, in such a way. There's so much evil that's going to bombard you. You won't, have a, you won't have the marriage that you should have without the power of God working in that marriage. And listen, I've seen the power of God uh, keep the marriage together when there was a spouse that's unsaved. If the power of God is not working there, it is nearly impossible for you to have a happy marriage. And I'm telling you, listen, that power needs to be... Listen, it's not only that. Not only that, you know why so many people are not effective when it comes to uh, uh, reaching outreach and trying to minister to their home? You know why you can't reach them lost kids that you've got in your home? Because there's no power. And the Bible tells us why and what would prevent us from having power. And I want to point that out to you. You'll probably see that as we read through chapter number 2. But I'll come back. I'm going to circle back. I'm going to read you the overview of the story and we'll come back. Verse number 12, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. Isn't that peculiar? Here's priests ministering in the place of God, offering sacrifices there, supposed to be a high and holy place, and they don't even know the Lord. Isn't that something? And the priest's custom. Isn't that something? Priest's custom. Was it the Bible that told them to do it? Was it the Word of God or was it their custom? You know what gets a lot of people in trouble? They esteem custom. We just do it this way at our church. Well, it's contradictory to the Scriptures. And so you just doing it the way you want to is not the way God wants you to do it. Watch this. And the priest's custom with the people was that when uh, any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came... And while the flesh was in seething, with the flesh hook of three teeth in the hand, he struck it into the, uh, the pan or the kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also there, before they burnt the fat, the priest servant came and said unto the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to uh, roast for the priest. For we will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And they weren't supposed to eat it raw. Remember that? They weren't supposed to get it that way. Now watch this. And if any man said unto him, uh, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desire, he, uh, then he would answer and say, Nay, but thou shalt give it uh, me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore the sin of the young men, watch this, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. 
and she came up with the, her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which thou hast lent unto the Lord. And they went to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did into uh, all of Israel. Now watch. And uh, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Boy, that's rough, isn't it? You know what they are? Not only they don't know God, they're fornicating with people at the church house. Isn't that something? You say it doesn't happen in churches. It does. It sure does. But I want, you, I want to show, I'm pointing this out because I want you to see where this winds up when we're done. Where this type of activity, when you got people sitting in a church who don't know God and their customs are contrary to the Word of God and they begin to do things like fornicate because they think it's okay, I'm going to show you where it's going to lead. It's leading in a bad place. And by the time we get done, we're going to see that Ichabod is going to be the name of the very son of one of these men, meaning the glory has departed. We see the process, the degeneration that's here. Look at verse number 23. And he said unto them, Why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons... For it is not good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Now watch. Notwithstanding. Now, Eli is going to be faulted for not carrying this further. Do you know that? There's a time when the man of God, and I'm not saying that with a syndrome, the man who God has called to be over the things has to step in and say, enough is enough. That's it. You're done. You're not doing this anymore. You're done. And, I, and you say, does God expect that? Yeah. You're going to see this in just a minute. You're going to see this. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. And the child, Samuel, grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there was a man of God, uh, there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear into the house of thy father uh, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did, and did I uh, choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to offer upon mine altar and to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Watch this. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation? Watch, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And honorest thy sons above me. You know, when, when you see the result of Eli's life, when judgment finally call, comes on him, the Bible says his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. You'll find that in chapter number 3. See, he talked to them, but there's a time when God expects you to intervene and to restrain ungodly activity. There's a time for that. Yes, there's a time to... Uh, let people get things right and the Holy Ghost work in their lives. But there's a time when you have to step in and say, that's enough. We're done. We're done right here. Notice what's going on here. God removes Eli. He gives the promise. I'm going to remove him. In verse number 35, I will raise up uh, me up a faithful priest that shall do according to, to uh, which is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And we see this is fulfilled later in the book of Kings. And I'm going to say this. 
If you won't do what God has told you to do, brethren, He will raise up somebody to put in your place to do what He told you to do to begin with. And I'm telling you, I don't want God putting a substitute in my life. I want to bring glory and honor to Him. I told my kids this, and this bothered my kids. It bothered a lot of my kids. But they get to this teenage years, and, and, and they get testy. Right? Now, I'm going to say this. I did too when I was at my teenage years. Right? My dad had to set me straight. But I told all my kids, I said, listen, Don't make me choose between you and my Savior because you're going to lose. You're going to lose. He was here long before you ever showed up. He is primary in my life. I have to please Him above all. And if you make me choose, you're going to be sadly disappointed. And that's the view I took. I've told my kids that several times. And listen, some of them knew I meant it. And I'm having to stand my ground now with some of them. I don't mean I don't love them. It just means I love God more. I have to please Him whether they're happy with me or not. Listen, that's the problem in a lot of homes. A lot of homes are trying to please this little one here and this teenager here. And and you, you can tell when they get start getting grown, the teenagers have the influence on mom and dad. Mom and dad, let me tell you something. God's ways have never changed. They're always right. Always. You don't have to move or be swayed by a teenager who's rebellious or who's out of the way. You stand your ground. Stand your ground. His ways have always been the same. Listen, if that prodigal son's father hadn't stood his ground where would his kids have come home to? If he would have gone where the prodigal was, where would the kid would have come home to? So you have to stay home and you have to be faithful and you have to stand the ground and you have to set the example. That way, when they want to get right, they know where they got to come to get right. Let's look at this. Um, chapter number 3, verse 1. And the child, uh, Samuel ministered unto the Lord, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. Let me tell you something. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. You know why there's no vision? I just read you why there's no vision. Do you know why there's no power in the church house now? Because the people that are sitting there don't know the Lord. The people there who caught up with customs more than the Word of God. The people who are sitting there are fornicating. In in the church, people are fornicating. Did it not say that? Listen, the power of God has departed because we want to honor people more than we want to honor God. That's why the power of God has gone out of churches. I want the power of God to be in this church, don't you? But guess who has to be first in our lives? And listen, it's every one of us. Listen, when they say the church is only as strong as the weakest link, I'll tell you what you do. If you don't believe that's true, you take a bicycle and you file one of those links a little bit thin and tell me where it's going to break at. Every home here needs to be strong. And brethren, let me tell you, it's up to us. You know what we're good at? The weak links, we're good at just finishing them off. Why do we do that? I don't understand that at all. Why don't we try to help them get stronger? Why don't we support them? Why don't we fortify them? Why don't we strengthen them? We're very good. Independent Baptists, I I love Independent Baptists because I believe they have doctrine right, but I've seen this stray in the last years away from what's right. I've seen it. And listen, the power of God is just about gone in a movement that I believe is right, but we have lost the balance. See, we have put men on a pedestal and said, Brother so-and-so says this, and Brother so-and-so... I don't care what Brother so-and-so says. I don't care what they think. We care about what the Bible says. Our custom is not important. It is what the Bible says that's important in our home. And each home here being strong 
makes us strong. Listen, I don't look at brethren here and say, I wish they would just leave. I don't like what this one, I wish they would just leave. I don't even pray. I don't even pray for you guys. It's, it's sad how some independent Baptists are. It's sad how some Christians period are. It's, it's the world, world around. When I pray for you, I pray specifically. Lord, help this area in Bucky's life to get strong. Help this area in Mike Swartz's life to get strong he is weak right here, and if he can strengthen this, our entire church will be strong. Lord, help him to stick around long enough to get things right. Help him to stick around long enough to be strong enough to stand on his own and support the rest of the church. That's how I pray for you, male or female. I want you to be strong. But listen, if we don't get that God has to be first in our life, we miss the entire boat. You want your marriage to be stronger? Put God first. Put God first. You know why a lot of marriages fall apart in Christians' home, Christian homes? Because it's all about what you want. Well, I want to do it this way, and I want to do it that way. I don't... Listen, if you get on the same page and look and say, what does God want for our lives? You'll start laboring together, and everything will iron itself out. Look at verse number 11, chapter 3. The Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And in that day I will perform against Eli all the things that I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever. For the iniquity which he knoweth. See, my brethren, it's not the things we don't know that are a problem. It's the things we know. We know what's right. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is sin. Listen, God has put his finger on things in your life that you know you need to fix. You know you need to work. And listen, I'm going to tell you, Eli was no different. He said, for the thing that he knoweth. He knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile. Was that Eli's fault? The part that he holds him accountable for is this next part. And he restrained them not. He didn't restrain them. He should have said, look, God is, is not, did not tell us to do that. We're not doing that. It's just that simple. Now, chapter number 4. Chapter number 4, verse 3, we'll start reading. We'll start at verse 1. And the word of the Lord, uh, the word of Samuel came into all Israel. And now Israel went out against the Philistines. It, um, Samuel's been established as a prophet. If you read chapter number 3, they know that the Lord's now speaking through Samuel. He says, uh, Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched against or beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined the uh, battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. You know what? They ain't got no power, do they? Their power's gone. Their ability to withstand the enemy is gone. Look at this, verse 3. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Watch. Watch this. Let me show you. When you get religious and you don't have the power of God, all you have left is a bunch of relics. You know what they're trusting in now? A relic. They're not trusting in the God of the relic. Watch this. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. So much talk about the ark of the covenant nowadays, isn't there? Ark of the covenant. Well, you know, we need to find the ark of the covenant. We need to find the ark of the covenant. I know where it's at. It's in heaven. This one right here is only a replica of the one that's in heaven. But let me say something to you about this ark. They had the ark, and this ark is going to do nothing for them. 
You know why? Because they walked away from the God who gave it to them to begin with. Look at this. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it uh, cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Did anybody read what I just read? Let us go fetch the ark. There's the ark. Let's go get it. We're going to bring it back. It will save us out of the hands of our enemies. See, that's the way you are. That's the way you are when you get out of God's will. When you don't honor Him and put Him first. You think the relics save you. You're not trusting in the God who gave it to begin with. You're trusting in that item. Whether Listen, and listen all religions do it, don't they? It may be a Mary, it may be a Buddha. They trust in that. I'm going to go rub his belly. You can rub his belly till it falls off and ain't going to do nothing for you. The God of heaven is far from all of that. Your little relics don't matter to him. Listen, we can have relics all day long. I listen, people wear crosses around their neck like it's some rabbit's foot that's going to deliver them. Let me, let me tell you something. Are you trusting in the relic? Are you trusting in the God who sent His Son to hang on that cross? I go to the nursing home. They'll grab them. They'll grab the cross. They, they like, you ever seen that? They like to pull it out. I got it. Look, preacher. Okay. I'm glad you have that. But are you, do you know the God who sent His Son to hang on a cross... Or you just got one hanging around your neck. An image of it. Watch this. Verse number 3. He said, Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people went to Shiloh, that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelt between the cherubims. And the two sons of uh, Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, oh boy, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Here's two sons of Belial. Two devil-possessed boys who are going to be out here carrying the Ark of God. It's like that in a lot of churches. It's like that in a lot of homes. Oh, they have the speech and the talk about God, but God is far from them. Religious, you see that? Verse number 5, and the, When the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang. Let me tell you something. You can go into church, and I've seen them hoop and holler. I've seen them yell and shout. And listen, I'm in favor of good, solid preaching and excitable preaching, whether it's excitable or whether it is just very straight and sobering. I've seen people who don't even raise their voice that I get plenty of help from. But let me tell you something. The, this nation of Israel is shouting. You don't note a church by the shout. You will, you will get yourself... I, I know some big camp meeting churches. They'll get in there and they'll shout and they'll hoop and they'll holler and I get excited about it too. You'll hear me say amen. I love that. I love it when it's right. But let me tell you something. If you think that the shout and the holler has anything to do with knowing God or honoring God, you better pay attention to what's going on right here. It was a loud shout to the point that the earth rang. And a lot of these people think that if you don't preach loud and you ain't loud and, you ain't, and everybody ain't saying amen and the whole congregation standing up and hooping and hollering, they think that it's not of God. I'm going to tell you something. Here's a shout. And I want you to see this shout so loud that the earth rings and tell me what happens. God ain't nowhere near it. You can hoop and holler and God may be nowhere near it. Look at this. Verse 5 again, When the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they, uh, they said, 
What meaneth the noise of the great shout out of the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. Do you see this? And the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God... See, see, the Philistines was thinking much more accurate than Israel was. You know what Israel's trust, trusting in? A relic. You know what the Philistines are thinking about? Oh man, I remember this God who split the Red Sea open. They have a God who is mighty. And that Red Sea closed. We remember that. They were afraid. My brethren, that's the way it should be. See, the Philistines knew that there was a God associated with Israel. I'm going to tell you, the people in this world knows that there's a God that's associated with Christianity that is real and is powerful, but if we're not careful, we will manifest to them that our God is not real because we don't do the honoring of God and the power is no longer with us to win the victory. I want you to see this. Listen, we need, we need to understand this world does know that they're, they can see the effect. Listen, you don't think a person like me gets saved, a person like you gets saved, and they see your life begin to change. They don't know that there's something real associated with that. Talking to people just yesterday, just yesterday, we were at the nursing home, and I had a, a, a glass bottle. Glass bottle. Uh, my, my wife gave me a, a, a cannon jar, and I said, can you bring me something to drink? I had to go to Ace, and Alex and Dixie met up with us. I said, bring me something to drink. She brought it in a can, and the lady said, what's in that bottle? Well, I said, I promise you it ain't moonshine, it's Coke. I said, I quit all that moonshine and stuff 28 years ago, all that drinking and carrying on. When the Lord saved me, I, I left all that behind. And they said, well, I, you know, I don't see where there's a problem. And I said, I said it was a problem. You know, she said, it was a problem for your life. I told my wife, I said, it wasn't just a problem for my life. Let me tell you something. I had a mother who drank and drugs kept her away from the house. There's a billboard right there on 462 down from my um, house. A man, I think it's Caleb Whitehead or something like that. A, a billboard. 2017 was hit head on by a drunk driver. You're going you to tell me, you're going to tell me that it's not a problem? That some people can handle it? No, it is a problem. But when I meet the people that I used to know, we used to run with in college, and they see me, they go, I, I, I met, a, I told the church here one time, uh, there's a cop, in, uh, which I don't, I think he's retired actually now. He spent his years in and retired. His name is Josh Gincarelli. He's right there in um, Spartanburg County Police Department. And um, after I got saved, I said, man, I've got to start making things right with everybody. So I went back and I'd stole stuff from people. I'd, I'd done all kind of horrible stuff that, that you wouldn't even believe. But I went back and tried to make things right with everybody I'd offended. And one of them was Josh Gene Corelli. So I knocked on his door. I knew where his parents live, and I drove there. I just, let me see if he, he just happened to be there. Came to the door. Yes, sir, how can I help you? He didn't recognize me at first. I said, Josh? He said, Mike Lofton, is that you? I said, yes, sir. He said, what happened to you? I said, well, I got saved. Got saved. The Lord saved me, changed my life. And he said, what? He said, I just got saved recently too. We sat down and talked. He said, Man, I, what happened to all this high till you die stuff? All this we're gonna live high life and all this stuff. I said, Jesus intervened in my life and changed my whole outlook on everything. Listen, this world knows the power of God. The Philistines knew the power of God was with Israel. But I'm gonna tell you, Israel blew it. And you know what, church? We'll blow it too. The opportunity we have to reach people. The opportunity we have to slay the enemy and to have a victory for God. We'll blow it. Watch this. Verse 6, And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise uh, of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? 
And they understood that the ark of the, uh, the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing hitheretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods, these, uh, these are the gods that smote the Egyptians with the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, quit yourselves like men. O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And Philistines fought. Watch this. And Israel was smitten, and they fled every man to his tent. And there was a great, very great slaughter, and there fell of, the, of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. We're going to see Eli is going to die when he hears the report. He's going to fall and, 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 and wind up dying here. But we see his wife. Look at verse 19. I want you to see how this ends. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings, uh, uh, the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her uh, husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of, uh, about the time of her death, the women stood by her and said, Fear not, for thou hast uh, born a son. And she answered not, Neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of the Lord is departed from Israel, because the ark of, the, uh, of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her, hus- uh, her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Let me say something to you. I don't know. I don't know at what point or if he ever stopped fornicating. This guy's married. Now, I don't know at what point ahead of time if any of that ever ceased. I don't see any record of it. I know there's a time span there. But here he is. His wife is with child. She names it Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has departed. Let me tell you the end result of us ignoring the warning signs that God gives us. The end result is the glory of the Lord will depart. Now we can come here, brethren, And we can have church, or we can come here and experience the power of God. Which one would you rather do? See, a lot of people go to church, but they go and there's no power. There's no power. I want the the glory of the Lord to fill the place. I want to have this church, I want it to have an effect on the community. I want to see lives changed. I want to see power. The Bible says... This I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I want to see the gospel change people's lives, don't you? Listen, I got a little taste of it. I've seen people's lives change. Once you get a taste of it, and you see a life change, and start doing what's right, and start getting excited about the Lord, you just want more. You're just like, Lord, I want to do more for you. I want to see another life change. I want to see somebody else heading on the right path. Listen, if you're going to addict yourself to anything, addict yourself to the ministering of the saints, as the Bible says, and getting the gospel out. That's a good addiction to have. It is. Let's look at a few things. We'll close. I'm just going to highlight these things very briefly. I want to note verse 12 of chapter 2. Verse 12, chapter 2. Verse 12 of chapter 2. Sons of Eli were uh, uh, sons of Eli were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. They had two fathers, didn't they? <laughs> Let me say something to you, and I want to ask you this. This is very important. Do you come here every Sunday, and you really don't know the Lord, or do you know the Lord? Is this just a religious thing to you, or just a fellowship thing to you? Or do you really know the Lord? It's important because I don't want the glory of the Lord to depart from here. I don't. 
And it's necessary that everybody here has a personal relationship with God themselves. Do you come to the door, is it a religious thing for you, or is it something where you really do know God? Only you know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. If, it's, if you don't know Him, you can know Him today. You can know Him. Listen, He loved you, died for your sins, just as much as He died for ours. And this church is going to be much better if you just throw in the towel and say, I didn't know Him before, but I know Him now. And I want to walk with Him now. And I want to help this church. And I want to strengthen this church. I want the power of God to be here too. I don't want Him to depart. Listen, He's been gone long enough, hasn't He? Listen, so many churches, He's been gone long enough. I want Him to be here in fellowship with us. Look at verse 13. And the priest's customs with the people was. If you read Matthew chapter number 15, you see that the Lord rebukes them for esteeming their tradition higher than the Word of God. How about you? What's more important to you? Custom and tradition? And listen, I wasn't raised independent Baptist. But there's a lot of independent Baptists that think that they're going to heaven because they were raised in an independent Baptist home. And you would be wrong about that. That's a custom and a tradition. You are going to heaven whether you're a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Pentecostal. And you say, that ain't possible. I'm not a Baptist brighter. I believe God saves people who believe on Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You're going to heaven because you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Listen, it's not custom. We're not coming here for custom. We don't take communion for custom. We don't get baptized for custom. Listen, we don't have fellowship for custom. We do that because that's what the Word of God says that we should do. Look at verse number 22. Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto Israel, how he lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Brethren, do you want God to use this church? Do you want God to use this church? I want God to use this church in a special way. But let me address this issue that is rampant amongst leadership. If you read Jeremiah 23, the leadership of the pastors in the Old Testament, it's rampant in the congregation. You know why it's rampant in the congregation? It's rampant among leadership. And it's, it seems, I'm not sure, but it seems that at least one of these Phinehas is committing adultery. It appears that way. You know why adultery... And fornication is rampant in churches, y'all. In churches. I'll tell you why. It starts with the leadership. You say it doesn't happen. Quit fooling yourself. That life that you're living, you need to live a pure life. I want God to use this church. But if we're going to come in here and play church and then go home and fornicate, shack up and commit adultery, God's not going to be able to use this church. We have to have a pure life. We have to begin to desire things that are right. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. The church is filled, just like it was in the nation of Israel. It's filled with this, well, I like it. His wife looks good over there. And, and so the next thing you know, those two are together, and this one leaves that one, and, and they're over here with the same congregation. You say it don't happen. It does happen. I know churches where it's happened. And let me tell you something. God is not pleased with that. That's not pleasing with God. If you're married and you're sleeping with another woman, you're committing adultery. I want to tell you that. You're committing adultery. You need to repent of that because God cannot use this church with you doing that in secret and nobody knowing. God knows. God knows. You tell me one of the reasons, one of the things. Why does God choose to point this out? You know why he chooses to point it out? Because it happens in every place 
where the people turn their way, heart away from the God and they're not honoring God anymore. It happens all the time. Listen, you know why God has walked away from a lot of our churches? Because people ain't repenting of this type of activity. Verse 25. Notwithstanding, they hearken not to the voice of their father. Let me tell you something. I'm not your daddy. And I'm not saying that when I say this. But let me tell you the problem and why Hophni and Phinehas ultimately wound up dead. They would not listen to good counsel. Don't get mad at me for saying what I said this morning. What I said this morning is trying my best to help you. I'm not saying it to hurt anybody. I don't know anything. Would it surprise you that I don't know anything? You know, I don't know anybody who's sleeping with somebody else here. Amen. But, I have to preach what the book says, because if it is happening, you're hindering this church from growing. Verse 25, 20, um, 29, we'll close right here. He says, Wherefore kick you at my sacrifice, Mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the cheapest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Listen, we got to get to a point where God is the primary goal in our lives. And if you're you're wrong in your life, you know what you need to do. Second Corinthians seven. I'm going to show you this. When you come and you hear the Word of God and that Word gets in your heart, do you have an attitude against your sins? Or do you have an attitude against the preacher? See, people get mad at the preacher. I, don't shoot the messenger. That's what the old saying is. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the messenger. Don't get mad at me. Because I had to take those furrows and dig them deep. Don't get mad at me. I'm trying my best to help. If there's a root that I hit here this morning, this is what you need to do. You need to just get it right. Once you get it right, let me tell you something. You need to put it behind you. I've, told, I've counseled somebody this just recently. Get it right. Put it behind you. And go forward and do something for God. You can. But you need to get it right. You can't ignore it. You cannot ignore it. You have to get it right. Look at this. Here's the attitude. Verse number 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. But that selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Listen, true repentance makes you careful. Listen, none of this fake repentance. If the Lord dealt with you, get right with God today. Get it right. But make sure it's true. Look at what it does. This is how you can tell true repentance. Esau repented and sought it carefully with tears and he didn't find forgiveness. Did you know that? Listen, there's a false repentance and there's a true repentance. True repentance is found right here. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. You should want the slate clear and move forward. Yea, what indignation. You should get an attitude against the things that we're hindering you. Yea, what fear. You should have a fear that if you continue in the sin that you're living in, that God is going to judge you just like He did with Hophni and Phinehas. You keep ignoring God is very long-suffering, but there's coming a time when He's going to say, okay, I can't do anything unless I judge this and make it open. He'll let you get it right in private. He will. But you better get it right. Because there's coming a time where He'll expose it. You may think He ain't, but there's coming a time He's going to expose you for being a fake. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And all things approve yourselves to be clear in this matter. You know what we're trying to do? We're trying to clear ourselves. Let me tell you something. Some of you have done some things that you regret horribly. Don't you? Is it just me? According to the Bible, you can be clear. 
Mankind may not clear you. There's a God in heaven who will clear you. He will clear you. But you're going to have to get an attitude against that thing that's keeping you in bondage. You're going to have to have some godly fear. You're going to have to reject it out of your life and say, I'm not doing this wicked junk anymore. Get close to God. Let Him help you. Let Him use you. I want Him to use this church. I believe sitting right here, right here, we have some of the greatest potential that we have ever had sitting right here this morning. But it's up to you how far you want to go with God. You may be content to let it go on and on. But if you'll repent, get an attitude against it, God can use this church. I want Him to use this church. Amen. Hope it was a blessing. Hope it helped you today. I did, I, listen, if you, if you were hurt this morning, I'm not going to apologize for hurting you. But I want you to know this. I'm not trying to hurt you in a bad way. I'm trying to get you to see that there's things in your life that if you would get right, you could have a much better relationship with the Lord and you could help this church tremendously. Amen? Let's stand for prayer.